afleveringen van Permacultuur in Australië hebben we gesproken met mensen die genoeg hadden van het leven in de stad, met banen en dergelijke en een voor een leven in de natuur hebben gekozen. Ze konden dit doen omdat ze hadden kennis gemaakt met het systeem Permacultuur. Een systeem ontwikkeld door de Australiër Bill Mollison en wat een grote mate van zelfvoorzienendheid kan bereiken. We zijn op zoek gegaan naar wat permacultuur nou precies inhoudt. En in Australië is dat niet zo moeilijk. Ook al is een afgepast antwoord moeilijk te vinden, want iedereen geeft zo zijn eigen invulling aan permacultuur. In deze aflevering gaan we op bezoek bij het Permacultuur Instituut in Mullaney, Queensland. En zij gaan ons een aantal demonstraties geven, waaronder hoe een permacultuurtuin aan te leggen. photo that we took before we began. This is the neighbor's land over here. So this area here comprises the two acres. As you can see, there are um, quite a few coniferous trees right out in this area. And uh, a lot of introduced exotic trees which have been gradually retired. <laughs> uh, the one, one of the ma major gifts of the area is that um, the owner uh, had planted a, a small citrus orchard, which we have over here, which has been uh, trimmed up and uh, that stuff cut out and been fertilized and mulched, and it, it actually threw off a very nice crop, and we're very grateful for that. Our overall philosophy here, and, and you have the sheets that I gave you, um, we work with a philosophy of the Institute that says the land cannot be owned. I'm sure that everyone here has considered that and, and probably agrees that we can only steward land. And so one of the things we do here is attempt to work with the, with the nature spirits. And before doing anything, advise, ask for guidance, and ask to be shown direction as to what we can do that will enhance what is here, even though what we're doing is all introduced. Because the best thing we can do is just leave it alone. Uh, and it just down at the bottom you have the beginning of a of, of, of the native forest that goes right down to the Obi Obi River. And in fact, if, you, if, uh, if you're around to drive out this, this Montville Road out here, you can you stop at the right place, you can look over and see the beautiful expanse of, of native forest that goes down right from our border. Uh, our neighbor down below is an ex-parliamentarian, uh, Turner, Neil and Uta Turner. We have two physicians, on either, a physician on either side, uh, both of whom uh, either one is and one will be growing organically. Mm -hmm. We're really pleased with that. So they're going to be very cooperative. We'll be doing a cooperative orchard uh, with uh, the doctor couple uh, next door. Here's the, the overall master plan. It was begun by Jenny in terms of selection of, of what to plant and carried out by carried on by Alan Atkinson. You can see. Uh, if we orient it for you properly would be this way. This was a two-car garage which we decided to uh, convert to a, um, a meeting room, a learning center, a place to come together for whatever's. Uh, this is something the Institute has always done. We've always been involved in creating environments for learning of many different kinds. Uh, for four, four or five years I worked in, in New Zealand working with several thousand educators uh, in using expanded brain function and, and bringing that into the uh, into the classroom so that the kids could learn to use a greater part of their brain in learning. So that was a different kind of environment for learning. This one is one I guess for, for our learning <laughs> uh, and for anyone else who wants to come on the land and, and use it. I don't have any as aspirations for, for teaching courses here. That's not my expertise. There are many other wonderful uh, people well qualified uh, to come and use the land uh, as a demonstration site as they might see fit and then perhaps conduct classes here. So basically, uh, we um, um, changed the road, uh, took out a few trees, and just after a lot of consultation and consideration and asking and meditating, began. One step at a time, like we all do. Here's the forest down here, the native forest. We plan to do some of our own forestation up here, whether it will be native trees or whether it will be trees for a woodlot. One of the primary focuses here is that we want to create 
a, a series of, of, of steps. First step is to create a relatively self-sustaining homestead so that we ask questions. What can we do there? Well, we can put a, a hand pump on the water tank. We can put a backup uh, diesel generator in. Uh, we can put a solar collector on the roof. Um, we can grow our own food. We can um, uh, put a little food away. We can put some seeds away. Uh, we can do a lot of things that will, will help this place to serve as we serve this place. So, um, I'll leave it open to you for questions. Just a couple things here. We, we probably will have a chook run in the orchard. Uh, I haven't had uh, much experience with chooks. I spent a couple years at Finhorn mm -hmm. Community as a gardener. And um, um, that was back uh, a few years ago. And that really introduced me to the, to the great joy, the real old joy of working with the plant kingdom. Um, and that's stayed with me. So my joy is getting out here and working with the plants in the soil. Uh, whatever is done out here is done cooperatively. This is not one person's task or vision. Uh, because the, the Institute is a nonprofit trust, uh, we, uh, we invite people to come and, uh, and be served themselves in the process of, of serving others uh, by utilizing the land. So that's the basic, basic story of what's happening. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, for real, in terms of starting to make some changes, in about June, mm. June, July. And the changes were mostly the physical to get the place ready with, with backups and so forth. We're just getting into the gardening. The, the trees have only been planted for a couple of months and, and the food production has only been in for maybe six weeks, eight weeks. We're just getting getting going with, with, with the wood. Is that right? That garden is only six weeks old. Yeah. yeah. Mm. Six weeks ago. And now we're going back and, and putting in uh, uh, legumes and, and cover crops and so forth into that. So what is this? Uh, well, that was going to be a woofer. Uh, that, that's what, what Alan drew into his, his plan, uh, is, is a woofer cabin. I'm not sure where we're going to put one or two of them, but we will have some. Okay. Now, actually, the complete keyhole hasn't, hasn't been put in, but with the, the avenue for it has. Can you explain that a little bit about the Mandel? Seedlings? I see that. Some of both. Now, some of our own uh, seedlings are, are, are now in the garden behind the house, which is a primary kitchen garden. These, I think, were all, all seedlings or things that the people just brought out to, and said, here, put in the ground. <laughs> uh, and right now we're, we're using um, uh, some pyrethrum on the brassicas, and we're using soap spray for any aphids, hoping that the ladybugs will move in very quickly. Yeah, but the idea of the keyhole is that from anywhere that you stand in each of these little mm. keyholes, this you is can a mandala, is it? all the way down. Yeah, and the whole, like several keyholes put together create a mandala garden. Mm. The classic concept of a mandala garden has these little keyholes in it. Those aphids, Helga, were washed off with a, with a hard running hose about two hours ago. <laughs> Didn't get them all. Didn't get them all, right. Oh, there's lady beetles already. Yes, yes there was some yes. yesterday, so. They're coming in. That's the thing with pest management. Sometimes you just got to be patient and wait and cross your fingers and hope that the predators come in. <laughs> so this is really more, it's a practical garden right now, and it's really still in zone one. Um, but um, it's more, it'll be more of a demonstration garden as one model of gardens with the, with the primary kitchen garden in the back. And even that'll take several several shapes. So Another here question. again, you just mulch, you, you, you fertilize, the mulch, and, and put uh, right. sheet mulch and uh, hay on top. Right. And then when you plant your seedlings, you, you add a little bit of soil in there? Yes. That's it. Yeah. Why and, you, you and, you, and you penetrate through the newspaper? Yes. Why did yeah. you put the mm. Well, the, the gravel, um, this was one way I'm experimenting with to control the Kikuyu invasion. Um, so there's, there's, there's uh, black plastic down under the gravel, then the gravel in here, then once every couple weeks I just take a sharp spade and cut around the edge and it takes care of it. It keeps the, the grass pretty much out. But you could and also plant an edge. Pardon? Yeah, we will be planting a comfrey and, um, and lemongrass edge and we're just raising some of it now and we'll be bringing in some more cuttings and so that will go in here too and eventually replace this yeah, yeah. yeah. and with the, with the mulching here on the plastic do you make holes in the plastic to put the plants in or not uh, the only plastic goes in about 
about this far oh, from the perimeter. Otherwise, it's just uh, the grass covered by a double layer of cardboard and then the, the straw over it. Did it have fertilizer underneath it? Yeah, there's some, some uh, manure and things like that. Yeah, but now the cardboard's just about all disintegrated, which is great because you can dig straight into it. <coughs> and it's taken a care of the grass, actually, which is nice. Still needs a bit of weeding. Mm -hmm. uh, I suggested he had 24 hours to vacate. <laughs> uh, and uh, and asked for a favor. Well, he seems to be gone today. I hope I hope the message got through. But it's, it's great, great fun doing that. And when it's successful, it's even greater fun. Uh, um, Alan put in a swale down below, but didn't put swales up above. I'm still not quite sure what his rationale was, but that was his his design element there. What was the plastic? Is that to kill the grass? Or? Yes, it's to uh, it's to keep it down until until as <laughs> further instructions come as to what we're going to put in there. Pulling in someone to cut the grass. I'd like to have this really maintainable by by a couple people, say uh, eight hours a week each. And so part of the, the interplay of what we're trying to do is to establish that and I'm, I'm sure it'll take a couple of years before we get that kind of a balance. The long answer to your short question, I'm not looking to put a whole variety of gardens in here for our purposes and the places available for that others want to do. Oh, just to be sure that I water it until we can find a good place to plant it. We wanted to hold it off until the, uh, uh, the the tree dedication ceremony uh, and the, the, the medicine wheel ceremony. And if we can, at least it's in a, in, in a good uh, place of, of honor and it gets watered every day. What's a medicine wheel? <laughs> Pardon? What's a medicine wheel? Who can tell us what a medicine wheel is? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. No, no. Okay, medicine wheel. Is, is one of the many circular forms, in this case a circular with a uh, north, south, east, west cross of stones uh, in the center of it. In part to give thanks to the spirits of the, of the four directions. And uh, it has many, many uses depending on the tribes that used it. Uh, I'm not sure if it was originally Native American, but it certainly is traditionally Native American. It's a place to honor nature and to uh, acknowledge our oneness with all of creation. And essentially to give thanks to, uh, uh, before doing anything, facing each of the four directions and uh, give thanks to the spirits and the winds of the four directions. It happens even on a highly productive soil when you just skim off the surface. Um, we tried just, just for fun to sow some grass seed. Well, the grass seed on the left has been in there for about six weeks. So what comes off the very top, even with an effort not to take too much off, depletes the, the vitality of the soil. So we said, fine, thank you Earth for telling us. We'll take what was taken off, we'll spread it back out again, rototill it up, and let the, and we'll let, let the, the, the natural system in the top layer return. We have a worm farm right over here, yes. Yeah, I find that with worm farm. We could sometimes stick a mouse trap on top because they come in and they eat the worms. Now what's interesting here is if, we, eat the worms. if we overfeed, we get a lot of little uh, little gnats. If we underfeed, of course, the, uh, the the worms are up there looking for more food. Uh, so last night we just happened to throw those in, but normally the worms are crawling around very, very well. And sometimes crawling right through the, uh, the hessian bag. Where's one there? Yeah. Do you put layers of hessian bag, like up or, or...? No, we just keep a moist hessian bag at the very top in this, this worm farm. Paul was saying that the mice can eat, can eat the worms. Oh yeah, yeah. So yeah. they need to mm, yeah. rats love them. I'm not sure they do. this side thought they wouldn't be able to get in, I would imagine. You need or to check out what sort of oh, mouse it is. Actually how it works. Hmm? I missed the explanation how it works. How it works? Yeah. Well, um... Permaculture experts? Oh, what the internal mechanism? Yeah. What what he's doing is filling this up because it's a top-down system, and you can pull up the. This just can slides you up. Maybe pop out of the middle for a sec, guys. Um, so it pulls out. You can pull this up, so you're just harvesting the material out of the bottom mm -hmm. that's been turned into cast. The thing with um, 
is with worms is that um, tiger worms or the compost worms always need some sort of food so once they've gone mm -hmm. through and devoured some material they'll go looking for the new material so they'll be moving up all the time into the new material that's being put in the top and you're being able to harvest from the bottom so it's quite a simple mm -hmm. and, so, so to start it off, you just throw in a whole heap of worms with some dirt and some, some kitchen Ma Manure scrap. and so forth. The next thing uh -huh. we want to put in is a layer of manure. We haven't done that for a while. Right. Really you don't really put that. dirt in either. It's you don't put that in. get too solid and things. Uh -huh. There's no need for it. Well, I'm just going to be late now. What was inside here eating the birds? <laughs> a little <laughs> rouse or a rat, I'm not sure. I don't know the species. But. The thing to understand with worms too is that there's two broad types of worms. There's garden worms, like your normal earthworm, and they won't live in compost. And then you've got worms that do live in compost, and there's a few different sorts, mm. but... Um, tiger worms. Tiger worms and um, red like wrigglers and worms. stuff like that. Um, yeah, night crawlers. And they won't, mm. they can't live without compost. So if you don't feed your worms, Maybe. they'll try and escape until they can find some. And if they can't find any manure or compost, then they'll... Um, They'll die, basically. So this is the chance for all the kinesthetic people to you do it in there. for the visual people to sit there and watch. watch. Yeah. When they oh, yeah. someone's stone, it's very muscle. <laughs> oh my god, you might go through the whole lot. Wow. <laughs> so what, what's happening now? Um, he's just showing us where he wants it. Oh, right. No, nothing scientific. I don't think we'll be able to do too big an area, no. Right, we're keeping it fairly small and can always make well, it smaller. Well, they've sort of got to be back. What do you think So we know where to go. Right. Oh, sorry, class. Hello. Nash is clean. Okay, does someone want to grab some chook chur in the wheelbarrow? <laughs> no. Chook chur in the wheelbarrow. <laughs> There's the wheelbarrow. Okay, yeah, that's that's enough cardboard. Ideally, the cardboard needs soaking. Yeah, you should wet it first. We can bring a, uh, a hose into play if you like. Although, you would have, we, uh, we can also bring a wheelbarrow over and fill it and soak the cardboard. Yeah, that's the smashing. Wow, how many wheelbarrows are there? Yes? Did you bring some chocolate in your pocket? Gotta touch it with our hands. Yep. Come on. I don't want it. Is that part of the course? Yeah. Like, do I fail if I don't do it? People that complain there's not enough. And you'll do it. This is it. Okay, so if you do this straight on, if you had big high weeds, you just chop the weeds down and they become your first, not your first layer. That's how it is. That's good. And, and also, actually, we probably need another bag of this if there's any more. And also, so we're about to put high carbon on, and we want to have a balance of high nitrogen, which this is, and then high carbon. Is there any more poo? No. I don't want to do it. Is there any more poo? Uh, yes. Uh, the, the, the farthest of the compost uh, uh, sections is filled with it. Oh, yeah. How many of you can have these? Baby shit. Why don't you bring the whole bag of horse poo? Oh, yeah, it's smellier. Is this going there? not breastfed, baby. It's soaking it. Yes, it is. Okay, now. Yeah. And then we're soaking it. Oh, it's been oh. soaked with cardboard. We're going to soak it in water first. Now the secret is everywhere use double cardboard and everywhere have it overlapping really well. If you have one little hole, grass and weeds will come up and they'll go out. And especially on the edges. Okay, so um, if people want to grab this and mark it. Yes. Mark it in Noah's beautiful design. Uh, we're working to wet it first. Yeah. It's just so it's easy for Noah to mow up. Mow up. I consider this a bit of an annoying, I a bit of pardon, no offence, but um, 
I'd actually, I'd just throw this on the top of something that's already existing. It's got holes in it. It's a bit weak in places. Wet piles. Just oh, there. great. So you want it all to be doubled. You're going to double it over. And especially the edge. Have a nice edge for Samoa. Samoa. There's a wet pile just over here. Uh, I always save my best bit for edges. Oh, let's be real careful. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but it's cold. Oh, oh, big meanie. Yeah. <laughs> oh, sorry, dear. What about the meal dry? Yeah, you help me. Ah! Oh, oh, it's dry. You just got wet. It's water. It's clean water. Always double. <laughs> <laughs> and where you got there, holes in it like that, Lara Chan, you need to cover it again. Do you need more shit here? More shit? More shit. Later. <laughs> Once we've done this. <laughs> Actually, can someone be grabbing some bun something green and leafy? Right, it's quite good not to walk. There's a hole. Do you want to be so we've got enough cardboard and we want to soak a bit more. Cardboard piece. It breaks down pretty quick. Let's change the layers a bit. Green leaf. Green leaf. Compost. 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 Yay! Oh, we just happened to have some. Oh, wow. Here's some. Look at these. I need to place it down over the seat. So if you want to spread this over the whole thing. Happens in the air. Yeah. You might even have more veggies than this, have it even thicker. For a real... Oh, not that this isn't real. Do you want a bit more of this? No? I think we have Can I stay? Yeah! Oh, yeah. <laughs> that, that yeah. 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 What is that beetroot soup? <laughs> oh, yum! <laughs> This is pretty. They're my sister's shoes. <laughs> <laughs> she's gonna just she's gonna just love it. Nothing quite like Who's the spreader? <laughs> and it's like making a cake. The more mixed it and the more delicious things you put in, the more delicious the cake's gonna be. Did you mean the cake? Right, hold a bit of the comfrey, actually. We sort of need some more greenery. Is there any more greenery? What would you like to do? Uh, we have more comfrey. Yeah, more comfrey. Okay, we have uh, some spread out down here. Let's actually, some of those happens. bananas need a bit of cleaning out. All right. Great. No. So ideally, and yeah. it fits nitrogen, it fixes nitrogen into the soil. Um, it can also be used for medicinal purposes. If you have a sprain, you can blanch it in some warm water, wrap it around the affected area, and it's just great for your compost and great to grow around garden edges because it prevents the grass from coming into any garden beds that you may have growing around. It's also <laughs> Okay. I'm scared it'll then come up in your I'm scared it'll come up. A, a layer of carbon, so Some we'll have hay? another a mulch yeah. layer. Oh, so Not cool. carbon, we'll have a mulch layer. Oh, okay. Yep, hey. Which way would suit mm -hmm. Yep, hey. Hey. Be careful. What? Put it right out to the edge. Hey! 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 The uh... Oh, Lawrence, I'm sick of hearing it. Go away from him, please. <laughs> Richard, leave him alone. I mean him. Go and tease that sensitive weed like this is Chicago saying. <laughs> When, when should we have done that? Right at the very bottom. Um, above the cardboard. 
I got the cardboard in the fridge. Before I get the just a thin layer now, then have more manure. More? Yeah. What's that, Michael? Yeah. Just a really thin layer now. Yeah. A thin layer? Thin. <laughs> thin. Well, we don't need this, I guess. A thin layer, well, we get, we're going to do another manure layer. Another layer? Mm. Layer upon layer upon layer. <laughs> Yeah. That's all, my Maybe we can take this. So what would you do now? Sure, sure. I was going to put some more manure in another layer, but I mean, yeah. Um, it's yeah, good to make it this high if you're growing on something like cement or on something that isn't very nutritious. In this case, Nora has got pretty good soil, yeah, exactly. or very good soil. Yeah, so we can use much less material. Yeah, but it doesn't hurt for Noah to do this because he's always going to have a, a nice yeah, yeah. viable soil. Especially if you have big areas to do, it costs a lot. Yeah, this, so yeah. Hmm. And you might even want to put more vegetable scraps, have it much more condensed than this. How long does it um, just leave it before you can plant? Oh, I'll tell the group as a whole, okay, when we're finished. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> We'll use sawdust uh, and maybe some 10 mil gravel uh, over the cardboard for the, for the um, well, no, I'm sorry, no, no gravel, just, just the, uh, the sawdust, so when it gets broken down in about a year's time, so it won't deplete the, uh, the nitrogen, we can then use that as, as more mulch and then just replace the pathways, but right, that, uh, I'm sure it's a good way of doing it. Um, we actually should have been watering as we went along. Now that it's got lime on it so it's less acidic, um, it's quite a good idea just to let it rot down for a while. If you're really desperate and want to plant in it really quickly, you just make, you make a hole like this and you might put your worm castings in there, a big lot of it, and then plant, plant into here and the, um, the little seedling will put its roots down and pull on a lot of the nutrients. But I think it's better to wait about six weeks or something till things have broken down. Um, and don't plant root crops in the first year. Why is that? Because they're, they're trying to go down and they can't go through that double layer of cardboard. Eventually that double layer of cardboard will break down and then there'll be lots of worms and it'll all be soft underneath. But now it's like a quite impenetrable layer, especially with the kikuyu grass, which is so tough. You need that to, to kill out the kikuyu grass. It is quite important to get plants in there at some stage, like to wait a while, but not just leave it for ages because mm. the plants, once they're in there, their roots start getting in there and homogenising the whole thing together. Yeah. I mean you can put plants it. in straight away, you just need to make sure you've got enough compost with them as they go in. Now you're a horsey! And water every layer, that's something we forgot. Yeah. Mm. We were a bit scared to fall on that hose anyway. <laughs> on the way naar uh, or whatever, it's the land of the Netherlands. It looks really nice.
het hippiedorp Nimbin gaan we op bezoek bij Klaas, Joke en Ellie. Een drietal Nederlanders die op universele spirituele basis een ecovillage gaan opzetten. Ze hebben daartoe een jaar geleden 40 hectare grond in de heuvels nabij Nimbin gekocht. En willen op een natuurlijke manier gaan leven met een dertigtal medebewoners. Ze hebben daartoe ook Robin Francis uitgenodigd, die we even later nog in het filmpje zullen gaan zien, om enkele cursussen permacultuur te gaan verzorgen, zodat het helemaal op de permacultuurbasis uh, bedreven kan worden. In ieder geval proberen ze uh, minimaal gebruik te maken van grondstoffen en energie. En mocht dit initiatief u aanspreken, dan verschijnt later in beeld nog het e-mailadres. Klaas laat hier de grond zien die hij dus heeft aangekocht. Ja. Hier kun je een brug over de rivier maken, ja. op dit stuk. Als je de Montana weghaalt, ja. dan heb je dus een, een stuk grond met uh, bos, ja. open land, een rivier wat er doorheen loopt. Ja, precies. En uh, dat is een prachtige combinatie. Ik vind het heel mooi stukje. Oh, ja, dat is het hè? Dus de, de overkant wordt er dan bij begraven, toch? En de overkant wordt er nog bij. Oh ja. Hier een brug maken en dan heb je dat open stuk daar aan de overkant hoort erbij. Daar ginds zijn nog allemaal hele grote bomen. Ja. Dus je hebt uh, uh, grote oude bomen op je land, ja. open land, een rivier. Maar hier zo? Ja, ongeveer daar. En uh, ja, dan moeten er nog allemaal bomen langs je zeggen. Nou, palmbomen ja. of iets, uh, ja. iets leuks. Uh, Huidooljoenen kunnen er aangeplukt worden. Oh, dat is helemaal uit de knobbel. Kijk eens. Ah, dat ja. is slim. Ja. En wat, wat voor windmolen is er dan? Wat moet je met het water ook doen? Wat is het bloot doen? Hoe moet je het doen? Er zijn een paar huizen die daar op het echt zitten. Maar het palen heeft de dam met de caldera. Ja, ik was er gewoon... Kort, 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 kort. Hé.
Benjamin is ook het ecodorp Joan Boon Gardens. Robin Francis, die we zo gaan ontmoeten, verzorgt hier haar permacultuurcursussen. En zij is stevens de ontwerper van vele permacultuurprojecten in de buurt. Daarnaast heeft ze vele boeken over permacultuur geschreven. the seeds. Mm. I use them for making our sweet chili sauce because they're so nice and fleshy. Mm. That's mm. nice. Trees planted around. The oriental plane will provide a nice big shade tree for an outdoor sort of um, open space mm. area. And uh, here we've got a nutty pear. This is a smaller deciduous tree so we won't get sort of big overhanging branches over the winter. Mm. What did you mix the bed? How did you make the bed? Um, this is soil. Uh, all these raised beds are topsoil that was removed for the building site. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Mm. A very heavy clay. Mm. Mm. Yeah. Mm. 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 Little low fence like that too. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's so happy. There's no reason to mm. get out, is there? Yeah. This is the white mulberries. Mm. Animated industrial waste. Mm. Only don't expect to have any of those sort of things going through here, but it's good to know it's a very effective plant. In the pond here you've got the treated wastewater and that gets cycled every day through the flow forms and so you can see how it aerates the water and uh, how it sort of oscillates and does its little thing from side to side and pulsates its way through so that um, oxygenizes and aerates the water which is the final part of the treatment. So the water in the pond there is of a quality that's quite safe for us to either pump back up and use in the gardens or we can it can just flow on through the drain system and down. Welcome. and welcome. Um, we're here at Genmon Gardens and um, I was informed you designed them. Could you tell me more about that? Yes, we got the land uh, six years ago. It was an empty cow pasture. There wasn't anything here at all. Uh, it's five and a half acres and the main purpose of the property and what we're doing here is an education centre in permaculture and sustainable living. Um, appropriate technologies and so on all come under that general banner as well as organic food production and working with ecology in design. So what we have here is a five acre demonstration farm and garden that feeds us and all the volunteers and workers that come through um, as well as all the people who do our courses and workshops and we often have a surplus that we trade with friends or sell at local markets. We have our training centre where we uh, conduct a regular program of permaculture design courses and all sorts of specialist workshops on a whole range of topics to do with self-reliance and, or, and um, alternative lifestyle. Um, we also have a small business called Earthwise Eco Products and uh, that is um, using the surplus produce that we have here and value adding that as organic conserves, jams and chutneys and pickles and herbal products, you know, skin ointments and skincare products and things like that. So, you know, all in all, it keeps us very busy and mm -hmm. it keeps us very well fed and we live in a, just an absolutely beautiful place. Right. I mean, it is a sanctuary of peace and harmony and abundance. Yeah. And uh, it's very hard now to, to go to the city at all. Right. Mm. But now in Australia, it, I mean, because of the climate, it's a whole year round of vegetable growing and of fruit mm. trees and everything. Yes. We live in a European climate, so I gather that must be different. Would you know any solutions to that in a permaculture way, of course? Well, 
you find that you know a lot of the uh, a lot of the clues for sustainable living in different climate zones you just need to look at the past and the traditional systems and so you find that in Europe you've got a short growing season but a very productive one because you've got um, a very fertile soil in Europe I mean, here in the warmer climates our soil isn't good because of the high temperatures and the high rainfall so most of the nutrients in the environment are actually held in the living plants and animals in Europe it's in the soil mm -hmm. to sustain that rapid growth for a short growing season and you'll find that there's an incredible history of all sorts of natural ways to preserve food for the winter months like you know if you've got room to have a nice big veggie garden you can keep all your carrots and your root vegetables in boxes of moist sand in the cellar and you know the tradition of keeping sacks of potatoes in the cellar and of preserving uh, you know the beans and the tomatoes and, and things um, there's uh, a lot of fruits and things that can be dried and things like sauerkraut is a wonderful uh, not only it's a great way of preserving things like cabbages throughout the winter but it actually nutritionally enhances it and so you've got more vitamin C and you've got more nutrients from sauerkraut than you have from fresh cabbage mm -hmm. and you can put a lot of cabbages into a very small space to store for the winter um, with modern technology we can also in cold climates create greenhouses, glass houses to grow food through the winter months and also to grow some of the warmer climate vegetables in summer because the summers don't get quite hot enough to get a good crop of eggplants uh, but with the greenhouse you do have a proper summer to grow some of those things like eggplants and zucchinis and, and get a nice crop off those. So um, using you know the stuff southerly aspects of buildings where you catch the the sun in winter. I have a friend in Bavaria um, he's got a glass house on the south side of the house and a little pond in front of that and he grows beautiful vegetables right through the winter and he's even got some tropical plants growing in it. He's got a dwarf banana <laughs> and it's amazing you know in the middle of winter when it's minus 20 degrees outside and there's snow all over the ground you go into this greenhouse and there's the banana tree and there's the, 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 the passion fruits and winter tomatoes and and vegetables and salads growing and uh, you just wouldn't believe it was the middle of winter. And the way it's set up, uh, your vegetable garden, is it the same way as what we've seen here in Australia? Which, could you do that the same way? Many of the principles you can mm -hmm. adapt. So, you know, you look at the principles of permaculture, of diversity and, um, you know, companion planting and polyculture and creating special microclimates and special niches for different types of plants to extend your seasons and using the garden landscape to support the climate of the house, um, the appropriate integration of, of technologies and so you just adapt things to your climate and to the plants that will grow in your climate. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So you use still raised beds and you cover it with mulch and then yes. newspapers or carbon yeah. boards and yeah. it's the same way. Yeah. Okay, well that's very encouraging. Mm. Yes. <laughs> yes. And the, the great thing with the mulch is that it's building up the fertility of the soil. It um, also um, protects the soil against the extremes of a lot of rain or, or, or water logging, um, as well as drying out when you, you know, have dry periods during summer. You don't get so much evaporative loss. Right. And it keeps the weeds down. And I think weeds have got to be the biggest bane of gardening. If you're planning a trip to Australia, do drop in uh, to Janbung Gardens. Definitely come for one of our garden tours. Uh, or if you really want to get um, a full experience of permaculture, you can actually stay here. We have um, small-scale accommodation and you can have your bed and breakfast and then you can help out in the gardens for your lunch and your dinner. And uh, Or you might even like to coincide your visit with one of our permaculture courses. So yeah, get in touch, email us and we'll let you know when our website's online and you can find out more and come and experience it firsthand. Wow, that sounds very tempting. Thank you, Robin. Bye.
have a different approach towards permaculture. Could you explain more about that? Yeah, I like to do my permaculture design from a very holistic sort of um, viewpoint because I see the landscape as a living, breathing, pulsing sort of entity with energy, pulsating with energy and that comes in lines of energy and points of energy. And uh, the Australian landscape is you know, well, very well endowed with these energies and the Australian Aboriginal people use these energies and the knowledge of these energies for their own purposes, for their spiritual activities or whatever. And in fact, a lot of the Aboriginal people have gone, but the energies of their sacred sites are still there, and it's very important to um, not build houses on them, for one thing, which, which happens, um, because we don't have the legacy of the maintaining of sacred sites, which happened in Europe. Um, unfortunately, a lot of the sacred sites were deliberately destroyed or, or accidentally or whatever. So we do have this legacy of this sort of haunted landscape, which... Um, we need to find our place in, I think, from that sort of more spiritual aspect. And uh, to me, that my connection with the, with the earth is a very spiritual connection anyway, so that's what I like to inject into my permaculture. And uh, before I discovered permaculture, I was a very keen environmentalist. I worked for Greenpeace. I tried to save the world every day. It was really hard work. Uh, not very satisfying <laughs> and depressing. But uh, it's much more positive and life-enhancing what I'm doing now, I suppose, and plus I'm sharing it and uh, writing about my understandings and my research and knowledge and, and sharing it with other people, teaching, that mm -hmm. sort of thing. And does it mean that you have been experimenting with energies on your property? Or? Yeah, I made sure I mapped out what the energy patterns were here before I put my cabins on, for instance, because I didn't want to have them located in any zones uh, like geopathic zones, uh -huh. such as where the underground water flows, which is very unhealthy to have um, to sleep or spend a lot of time in a geopathic zone. This sort of knowledge is better known in Europe, the uh, German-speaking countries. It's very um, widely thought of in terms of when you're about to move into a house or if you're building, you would always call the dowser in. So that's the sort of work I'm involved with when I do consultancies for people. I'm, I go and help help them to appreciate what they've got with their land, uh, the native tree, what the native trees are there, how what use they could be made of indigenous flora and flora, um, and tuning into those subtle energies which were so so vitally important to people mm -hmm. 5,000 years ago. Um, and that appreciation has been lost through, you know, so many reasons. But uh, the energies are still there. We can tap into them. We can actually make very good use of those energies and uh, use them to enhance our well-being, the well-being of the plants and the animals. In fact, that's what I really like to go around doing now is to set up beneficial energy fields for people so that um, it just makes it a bit easier for to grow things. Mm -hmm. and, and it's part of that whole holistic understanding that I like to um, to think in terms of. Mm -hmm. And now you, you've set up a, a sort of tower on your land. Yes, I've got these uh, so-called towers of power. I've got four of them now. And, um, and I've built 44 of them all around Australia, southern Australia. And that's been very interesting work because um, they're based on the Irish Round Tower which was the premier religious structure of Ireland. There used to be hundreds of them. And uh, from the understandings of Professor Callaghan, an American professor who was an expert in radio engineering and uh, also insects, he had um, a brilliant understanding that he came to that these towers were actually antennas picking up natural energies from the sun, particularly from mm -hmm. the Schumann cavity around the earth, the Schumann waves, very good for our health Schumann waves, and the magnetic monopoles that come from the sun and it's able to collect them because of that tower shape and the materials, having the correct materials, uh, they were able to collect these energies and harness them by putting them down into the ground which then stimulated the biological activity in the nearby areas. So. Uh, it is known in Ireland that the, uh, the land is very lush around these Irish towers. So Callaghan then went out and started experimenting with smaller ones and suggested that other people do that. So that's what I've been doing and um, getting other people to experiment because we're still at a very, um, you know, kindergarten level of understanding. So 
I've had some heard some fantastic feedback just of people just feeling better, that they feel stimulated by the energies around the tower when they're near the house. Um, you know, and life seems to flow more smoothly for them. Um, the animals are attracted to them. Uh, when my dog came back from having surgery, every morning she'd go out and run around the tower, mm -hmm. and she never normally did that. And uh, and then of course with the plant growth, this is what um, I'm really keen to see is that it's a um, you know very simple method of increasing plant growth, and organic farmers need all the help they can get. Right. Yeah. So uh, some farmers I've spoken to have actually doubled their crops just by putting up towers, a mini you know a mini version of the Irish tower. And where do you get a, a tower like that? Uh, well you have to make it, um, there's various designs that you can use but um, basically it's a tube of rock dust. I mean it sounds really simple. Yeah just but, a normal tube? Well like you know, any plastic tube? pipe of plastic rock pipe? dust. They're, they're the, that's a type that I make but there are um, much nicer ones that you could make them out of stone if you wanted to but you have to have the right stone. And this is the other uh, interest I've had is in the um, the special magnetic qualities of certain rocks and, and this area here, the Northern Rivers area, is very well endowed with volcanic rocks and uh, these have this paramagnetic quality which is sort of like a low level of magnetism and mm -hmm. we've known for a long time that magnetism has a stimulating effect on um, you know cell repair or mm -hmm. you know, various healing processes but uh, it can be a bit strong, you know a magnet is strong, it actually hurt you if you put a magnet around your heart or your eyes or something, you can actually cause a bit of damage. Paramagnetism is a very low level of magnetism and um, and that's put out by the dust. And it's actually put out as an energy field by certain rocks, volcanic uh -huh. rocks, and uh -huh. we have the basalt here which is very good. So th there's all sorts of great um, benefits from doing this and uh, I've just never ceased to be amazed by some of the things I'm discovering, the fact that it can actually, this low level energy field from this rock can actually protect you from radioactivity. Oh, and that's that, uh, yeah, certain organic farms that had rock dust of this kind spread over them before the Chernobyl accident actually had produce which had no residues of cesium-137. So um, the energy field somehow repelled that, you know, radioactive energy. So. Radioactivity is, you know, an energy from rocks, and so is paramagnetism. You know, why not have mm. a, a good energy? So, um, so there are ways of antidoting radioactivity and radiation from electrical sources, right. which, of course, we are bombarded by radio waves, TV waves, electric, electric. Yeah, so you could also use spectrum. it in, in house, maybe. Well, that's right. People are using um, bags of rock dust around their computers. They're wearing them, mm -hmm. um, and you can, you know get a ton of it at the quarry and it'll go a long way. The uh, the Austrian people are very advanced in this technology and they're actually selling little bags for, for you know, lots of money. Oh, yeah. So, um, But I just like to share that very simple understanding with people so they can actually do it themselves because there's nothing complicated about it. It's just a simple gift of nature. If you right, like. right. Mm.